And we're looking, as, as Stuart said, at that story of Jairus, Jesus, Jairus, and, and, a, and a sick woman. Let's just pray before we look at these verses. Father God, we come to your word knowing that we need your spirit to speak to us, to make it real, to make it living, for it to really have impact. So, Father, we ask that your spirit would speak to us now as we listen to your word being thought through and talked about. Amen. Amen. Um, people, um, we, we often have all sorts of questions, don't we? Um, everyday questions. Do I look good in this? Was I right to say that? Do my socks actually match? I have black trousers, and but lots and lots of dark blue socks. And in the morning when the light's not very good, I sat there at the sock drawer looking and thinking, is this black or is this dark blue? And then even the ones that appear to be black just are really, really, really dark blue. And you don't notice until you go out in the sunlight. There's all sorts of little questions we ask ourselves. Do I look good in this? Was I right to say that? Am I wasting my time with this other thing? And sometimes, in all the little questions, sometimes some really big, deep questions come through. Why am I here? Why do I exist? What is life actually all about? Is there a God? And if there is a God, what is he like? Now, for some of us in the room, we've probably answered those questions already. But for some of us, we might be still saying, is there a God? And if there is a God, what is he like? And that is one, I think, of one of the deepest questions we can ever ponder, we can ever think about. What is God like? Now, the Bible's answer to what is God like is to say, look at Jesus. That's the Bible's answer. You want to know the nature, the character, the attitude of God? You want to know how God will react? Look at Jesus. Do you want to know what God will do, how he will respond, what he would say in that situation? Look at Jesus. You want to know what God's like? Then ponder the verses here in Luke chapter 8. Because in Luke chapter 8, we're seeing Jesus, God in flesh, interacting, responding to people. I, I love to watch people. I, 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 I sometimes get in trouble for doing it because you just, I don't know, you're in a restaurant and maybe you're on your own and you're just watching what people are going on and then you realise people know you're watching them now and it all feels a bit sort of, and you've got to try and concentrate on something else, but now you're interested in what they're doing. I love to watch people. Well, with the gospel record and with this particular story, we can watch very carefully what Jesus does. We can see how he acts, how he responds. And I think he comes over as caring, he comes over as concerned, and, and there's bucket loads of compassion. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. What do we see here that God does in this situation? He shows real care and concern and compassion. Two completely different people, and yet he so shows such compassion. A young girl was suffering from cancer. I've, I've told this story before, but it makes the point. I? A young girl was suffering from cancer, and as she was, was going through the pain and the worry and the sickness, the one thing she really dreaded was going to school with no hair because of part of the treatment, she had lost her hair. And she dreaded the idea, and she dreaded the actual day when she went to school with no hair. But when she got to school, and she walked into her classroom, what she actually saw was that every child and teachers and, and the TAs in the classroom, they had shaved their heads. Instead of sort of, oh, goodness, what's happened to you? They had shaved their heads. And in unity, there was this visible compassion. You read the verses here in Luke 8, and you see this visible compassion for these two very, very individual, the different individuals that Jesus shows. Jairus, important synagogue leader. The lady isn't even named. An unnamed woman. Jairus was most likely wealthy, probably not stinking rich, but reasonably well off. This lady is broke. We're told in other chapters, because this, this, this story's uh, spoken about in Matthew and in Mark, we're told that she'd spent all her money on doctors and grew no better. 
Jairus was a respected man with a position. This lady was a social outcast, rejected, outcast, considered to be unclean. Her illness meant that she couldn't really take part in the worship of her community, of her society. Jairus had enjoyed 12 years of a daughter that he loved. You can see how much he loves her in the way he reacts in these verses. This woman had enjoy, endured 12 years. Isn't that interesting? 12 and 12. 12 years of, of, of this Jairus had enjoyed this daughter. 12 years this lady had endured this illness. Jairus came to Jesus openly. This woman comes to Jesus secretly. And then in the end, when it comes to the point of healing, Jesus wants to do the healing for Jairus' daughter secretly behind closed doors with just a few disciples. But then at the end, he wants to call this woman out publicly and openly in front of everybody and talk to her. So they're very different individuals, and they're treated differently, and they react differently. But there's three things I just want us to pick out and ponder that are, are, are common to all. These three things are common to both these very different people. And I've just got three little thoughts for you to ponder. And that's what I want you to do. So very different, but these things, three things they had in common. First thing they had in common is they both had a desperate need. A desperate need. If you read the verses before, and Andrew spoke on this last week, Jesus had just healed the demon-possessed man. When the people have seen this in the area, they are frightened, and they basically tell Jesus to go. So he goes. But then he crosses the river, and other, uh, the other stories tell us, he crosses the river, he literally lands on the shore at the other side to be met by Jairus. And I think this is God's incredible timing. It was right for him to leave, and when he came, it was just God's timing that he came just in the right time to meet Jairus. There was also crowds, we're told, crushing crowds of people. He was rejected, Jesus, from one place. He's received at another place. And this Jairus, he throws himself at Jesus' feet. Now, most of the religious leaders, they rejected, they opposed Jesus. But this Jairus is desperate, and he falls at Jesus' feet. Verse 41 says, pleading for his dying daughter. I wonder if he'd not been in this situation with his daughter, whether he'd come to see Jesus. And if he had come to see Jesus, it would have been in a position of opposition to Jesus. And that makes you think, I wonder sometimes if tragedy knocks the stuffing and independence out of us so that then we can reach out for God, which we wouldn't have been able to do if we hadn't been through that tragedy. Then you come on to this unnamed woman. Jairus has got desperate need. His, his 12-year-old daughter is dying. Then this unnamed woman, Mark tells us in the, in the account that he's suffer, she's suffered, she's had many doctors, she'd spent everything, and she just got worse. So her need isn't desperate, it isn't instant, but it's something she's endured for 12 years. And she sees Jesus as an opportunity to put things, hopefully to heal things, to make things better. Both of these people with a desperate need, both of these people fall at Jesus' feet. Did you notice that in the verses? Jairus, as soon as Jesus arrived, the woman wants to say secret, but when, she's well, when she chooses to reveal herself, she falls at Jesus' feet. Did you notice this as well from the verses? Both of them had nowhere else to go. The woman had tried all the doctors. It hadn't worked. Jairus just simply did not have time to go anywhere else. And who else could have brought someone back from the brink, from death? Jairus needed a miracle. This woman needed healing. They both had nowhere else to go. They both fell at Jesus' feet. Can I just stop you there in the story? I think we are in the same situation. You and me are in the same position in that we really have nowhere else to go. Spiritually, there is no one else under heaven, no other name, no other place, by which you and me can be put right with God, by which the lump sum of everything we've done and said that is wrong can be sorted out. 
In Acts chapter 12, it says these words, There is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There's nowhere else we go. We can go. And I think if we just simply look at the world around us, we actually come to that conclusion without the Bible having to tell us. There's a comedian, I don't know if you've come across him, his name is George Carlin. He's an American comedian, and he was, he was well, very well known in the 70s and the 80s, probably more over in America than here. And he wrote a little sort of poem. Now, I'm going to read it all to you, but I want to read you some sections of it. And it's called The Paradox of Our Time. And he's summing up the culture that we live in. And this is what he writes, because it's very insightful, because he's telling us in the same way that the Bible does that there's nowhere else to go. This is what he says. We have taller buildings, but shorter tempers. We have wider freeways, but narrower narrower viewpoints. We spend more, but have less. We buy more, but enjoy it less. We have bigger houses, smaller families, more conveniences, but less time. We have more degrees, but less common sense. We have more knowledge, but less judgment. We have more experts, but more problems. We have more medicine, but less wellness. We have multiplied our possessions and reduced our values. We have learned how to make a living, but not how to live a life. We have added years to our life, but not life to our years. We have conquered out of space, but not inner space. We have done larger things, but not better things. We have cleaned the air, but we have polluted our souls. We plan more and accomplish less. These are the times of fast food and slow digestion, of tall men and short characters, of steep profits and shallow relationships. These are the times of world peace but domestic violence. We have more leisure, but less fun, more kinds of food, but less nutrition. It is a time when there is much in the shop window and nothing in the stock room. Now, that's a comedian. Now, I don't know about you. I don't find that very funny. And he's a comedian. But it's so very true, isn't it? This is a time when there is much in the shop window and nothing in the stock room. They had nowhere else to go, so they fell at Jesus' feet. And I would be honest with you, I think we're in the same position. Spiritually, for life, for eternal life, for meaning, for understanding this life, we have nowhere else to go, and we need to fall at Jesus' feet. So although these people were two very different people, there was one thing that they had in common. They had a desperate need, and they saw Jesus as the answer to fix it. What else they also had... They also had active faith. They both made a reach out for God in faith. Jairus did it openly, and I think that took some real courage. This woman did it secretly. Maybe she didn't have quite the courage, or maybe she didn't have the self-worth to think that Jesus would even bother with her. Jairus, first of all, leader of the synagogue, usually opposed. When you meet characters like this in the Bible, they're usually opposed to Jesus. And yet here he reaches out for Jesus. Why? Because he's not just the leader of a synagogue. He is a desperate parent. And he wants life for his child. In Mark, it tells you the words he says to Jesus. He goes up to Jesus and he says this, My little daughter is dying. Please come. Put your hand on her so that she will be healed and live. It's clear in in Jairus' mind that this girl is dying. It's also clear in Jairus' mind that if Jesus touches her, she'll live. So he comes in that faith, and he's reaching out publicly, but he's coming in faith to Jesus. He's the leader of the synagogue. But all of that is stripped away. And all he is right now is a desperate parent with a dying child. And that is what causes him to act. And sometimes I think you need the desperation to strip away everything else so that we will act. Then in verse 44, the woman comes. She comes very differently. She sneaks up behind him. She's hidden in the crowd. She believes... 
that if she just touches the edge of his cloak, she'll be made well. So in a way, she's coming in faith, but she daren't come openly. And as you read these verses, you think, why? Why can't she? I mean, loads of people, people with leprosy, social outcasts, all, loads of people came to Jesus publicly. But this woman couldn't do it. Why couldn't she come? Why did she act in this way? Why didn't she ask? Why didn't she come openly? I think she couldn't because of her, her kind of mindset. She was an outcast. What was going on inside, the problem she had meant she was unclean. She shouldn't have been in the crowd. She probably thought she couldn't go anywhere near Jesus. But at the same time, she wanted to reach out and just grasp healing. I think her whole situation for 12 years had ground her down to the point where she probably felt she couldn't ask. So what does she do instead? You read the verses, she steals healing, in effect. And she stays hidden to use Jesus in this way. Do you think, just think about it. She reaches out through the crowd and she just touches the edge of his cloak. It's almost like going through a drive through rather than staying at the restaurant, isn't it? I'll just grab it and go. I'll grab healing and I'll go. Now, McDonald's, they let you sort of you know, go through, drive through, grab it and go. They don't mind. They want you in and out as fast as possible. But you go to somewhere posh. I don't know what a posh restaurant would be. Let's say Jamie Oliver's restaurant in the centre of town. If you walked in and you say, I'm just grabbing it and going. I don't want to stay. Just stick it all in a bag for me. Uh, they'd probably be a bit upset with you. Hold on. Hold on. Our food is a bit, bit too good to be shoved in a bag and then you shoved out the door. It's the whole ambience you're playing for. Plus, you'd be paying quite a bit. But anyway... I think, I mean, I don't know about you, when, when the kids nip into my office at home and they grab and go, as it were, they pinch the sellotape because they're making something, and then I spend 15 minutes searching for the, well, not usually 15, but I spend a great deal of time searching for my stapler or searching for the sellotape or searching for a ruler. I now go automatically to one of the kids' bedrooms to find. But I don't like it. I get annoyed by that. And yet Jesus doesn't respond to her stealing healing from him with annoyance. Why is that? I think it's because Jesus heals not just the illness, but the person. There is more going on here than the illness. Jesus also wants to heal the person. That's what we see in verse 45. Jesus stops. She touches the edge of his coat, and Jesus stops, and he said, Who touched me? Now, they think this question's madness. In some of the accounts, it tells you that they laughed at him for saying this. Hold on, you're, be, you're being pushed and shoved all the time, and you're saying, who touched me? And Jesus says, no. I want to know who touched me. And in, in Mark's gospel, it says that Jesus kept looking round. This was important to Jesus. Now, imagine what Jairus is thinking right now. He's thinking, hold on a sec. My daughter is dying. I am desperate to get you to my daughter, and you're worried about being touched by somebody in the crowd. Jairus is probably thinking, come on, let's hurry. And I think there's a lesson there for each one of us. And the lesson is this. Sometimes what we consider to be urgent, God allows to wait. God puts it off. God doesn't think it's as important as we do. And then some things that we think, well, it, it doesn't matter. They, they, there's no rush on those particular things. God says, I'm focusing right on that. And I think that spells it out in this. What happens here is Jairus' daughter is at death's door, but Jesus wants to stop to have a conversation with this woman. What is urgent is not urgent to God. What's actually urgent to God is, is a long-term issue that he wants to deal with right now. And I just think those, that, that little, little section there just tells us God's timing is not always our timing. So don't go around thinking God is always going to play by your timetable. My timetable is not. So we see in these, these verses, we see desperate need, but we also see active faith. These two people got 
healing because they, they reached out. But the healing they got was complete, complete restoration. That's the first, third thing we see. These very different people, did very different circumstances, both had desperate need, both have active faith, both were completely restored. Go back to this woman again, in the crowd. Jesus is saying, who touched me? Now, I think that Jesus being God, he could have walked straight up to this woman and said, you touched me. I think he could have done that, but he didn't. He stands back, and as Mark says, he waits. He's waiting. And then she comes forward, verse 47, if you look at the verse, it says, trembling with fear. She's thinking, oh no, what is Jesus' response going to be? She falls at his feet, and then look how Jesus treats her. He doesn't tell her off. He isn't critical. She has used Jesus. She has taken healing without asking. She has been incredibly sneaky, if you think about it. But he doesn't respond to her. He judges her not by her actions, but by her faith. Isn't that interesting? We'd all judge her by her actions, wouldn't you? Oh, come on, let's be honest. You'd be, I would be, I would have to tell her off to start with, wouldn't you? Oh, come on, you can't just grab the end of my coat and expect me to do... You could, if, if, I would, wouldn't would you? Let's be honest, we would, wouldn't we? You know, it's like when we forgive people. We certainly like to make, to make sure they know that they have been forgiven, don't we? We do. We want to make sure they know. We do, we like that. But Jesus doesn't respond just to the circumstances and just to what he sees. He responds to her faith. And he says this in verse 48, Daughter... Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. He calls a daughter. Now, this lady for 12 years has been a social outcast. I wonder if anybody's called her anything affectionately. He praises her faith. He could have been criticizing her actions, but no, he praises her faith. She reached out, and that was what made her well. And then he says a blessing. Go in peace. He didn't criticize her. He didn't tell her off. He he really responded to her faith. And what is he doing? He is building this broken woman back up from the inside. If it was just the illness that mattered, he could have walked straight on saying, oh, someone touched me, I felt power go out, but I'm carrying on because we're in a rush. But actually, it wasn't just the illness that mattered. It was her spiritual condition, her self-worth. Her, her, her thought of herself before God, that's what really mattered. And Jesus wanted to build that back up. And then we go back to, to Jairus. In verse 35, it tells us that while this is going on, people come, probably servants, to Jairus and say, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Now, I can imagine that this... He totally crushes Jairus because he's been so close. I mean, I imagine this is a roller coaster ride. He is there, he's there, uh, he's looking at his daughter who's ill, and then he hears Jesus has just arrived on the shore. And he puts the two together and he thinks, right, if I get down to Jesus, if I get Jesus back up here, she could be healed. So he rushes down, and then he sees the crowd. So, so he's gone from no hope to a little bit of hope. Then he sees the crowd and he thinks to himself, any minute my daughter could be gone. He sees the crowd, and he struggles through the crowd in the hope to get Jesus to his daughter. So there's a little bit of hope. And then these men walk in, or these servants walk in, whoever they are, and they say, Jairus, don't bother him anymore. It's too late. And I can imagine he just comes crashing down. Interesting, isn't it? He had enough faith to trust that Jesus could make his daughter well. But judging from what the people were saying, whether he was of the same mind, he probably didn't have enough faith to think that Jesus could bring her back from the dead. What does Jesus say? Don't be afraid. There's a little study in it in itself. That appears all sorts of places in the Bible. Don't be afraid. Just believe. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, trust me. And then it's not in the other versions, in the other um, stories, but it says this, she will be healed. Don't be afraid. You trust me. 
She's going to get better. Jesus is saying, look, you believe I could heal her? Come on. Believe I can bring her back from the dead. Jesus is drawing out more faith, more trust from Jairus. In essence, he's saying, look, you can trust me. You can put your trust in You can put total trust in me. See what I can do. He goes then to the house. He shuts out the people who are mourning. By this time, they've already got the funeral sort of things in, in place. It's all about to happen. He takes with him just a few disciples. He kind of dismisses the crowd. And just a little group secretly go into that room. And there is the daughter lying dead. And everybody knows she's dead. Jesus has said, oh, she's just asleep. They've laughed at him for that. It's the second time in these verses they laugh at Jesus. And we're told he sort of speaks to her, he takes her hand. He just brings her back with a kind of wake up. I love this story. In one of the children's Bibles that I read to Emily and Daniel, it simply says this. When it comes to this bit of the story, it says this. Jesus reached down into death and pulled her out. I think it's brilliant because it illustrates what's going on. Jesus reached down into death and pulled her out. Verse 42 says they were completely astonished. Well, you would be, wouldn't you? He wasn't just healing the girl. He was building up Jairus' faith. Look, Jairus, you can trust me. You don't need to be afraid. I will bring your daughter back from death. Jesus wanted this religious leader to see, to believe, to trust, to follow him. So Jesus draws out of this man deeper faith. Jesus wants us to do the same to reach out like the woman, or to reach out like Jairus. Jesus wants us to trust him and to put our faith in him. He wants that. One last thing. The sickness of this woman and Jairus, Jairus' daughter, what they went through, in a way, it led to their greatest understanding, their greatest experience of God. And you have to look back and say that if they hadn't gone through that heartache, they wouldn't have seen that complete restoration that they saw. Do we see that? You know, I don't know about you. I would like life to be smooth. No ups, no downs. Well, actually, loads of ups, no downs. All right? Smooth up there. I like smooth up there. That's how I like life. But actually, what you find is sometimes it really dips and it really goes down. And we come back up again, and, but we don't realize, actually, at those times when we dip and go down, they can be sometimes the times where we have our richest understanding and experience of God, when he restores and he brings us back. And if we hadn't gone down, we would never have been able to experience God in that way. Jairus, I think, would have been a religious leader that would have dismissed and opposed Jesus had it not been for a daughter at death's door. This woman probably may, I don't know, maybe you don't know for sure, we don't know. But this woman may not have even bothered being in the crowd. No reason to go and see Jesus except for 12 years of illness that have brought her to the point where she thought, if I can just touch. So I don't think we should sort of always be down upon the fact that sometimes heartache and tragedy come into our lives. We should recognize sometimes God uses those very things so that we find a richer, deeper understanding of him. So to sum up, three very different people, but they had a desperate need, which meant that they had nowhere else to go, which meant that they fell at Jesus' feet. They demonstrated, as each one of us should, they demonstrated active faith in front of everyone for Jairus, hidden and sneaky by this woman, but it was an act of faith. And then, through showing faith, they they experience complete restoration. And what do we see here as well? We see what God is like. He meets needs. He rewards faith. He restores completely. He cared not just for the illnesses of these people, but for them as individuals. 
My dad, I've said this before, my dad had a heart attack years ago. He was in Glenfield Hospital, and when he was in hospital after the heart attack, the consultant came round. And he was sort of wanting to chat to the consultant. The consultant was not interested in my dad at all. In fact, my dad said he never talked to any of the patients. He talked to the other doctors. And afterwards, my dad said, I realized the consultant was interested in my condition, my problem. And to effectively manage all the different, he couldn't really get involved with everybody. He was interested just in the heart problem, the condition. Jesus is not just interested in the, 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 the problem here. He's not just interested in, in healing a woman who's been sick for 12 years. He's not just interested in bringing that daughter back from the dead. He's interested in the individuals, Jairus and this woman. And he wants to restore them, not just fix the problem. That was how complete his restoration was. Desperate need, active faith, complete restoration. Let's pray. Father God, we recognize that sometimes we consider things to be urgent, but you allow them to wait. Sometimes that we think of certain things are unimportant, but you choose to focus on them right away. We recognize as well that, that, that you are a God who, who meets needs, who rewards faith, who wants to restore completely those who come to you. So help us, Father, we pray to be those that come to you, that depend on you, that fall at your feet. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.